You can't really talk about the natural history of Earth without discussing the fossil record. The fossil record gives us a picture of the life on Earth or the natural history of our planet. It will tell us about the kinds of organisms that used to exist, it will tell us about mass extinctions, it will tell us about new species showing up in the fossil record. And there is a certain degree of bias because it's not every single animal that's preserved, but it does give us a very good picture of how life used to be and the processes that it went through to, for life to change over time. So it shows us patterns of biodiversity just like it's, we can see it today. And this allows us to have a greater uh, time to actually explore the process of evolution. And yeah, in fact, if you were to try to explain the fossil record without the theory of evolution, you would have to come up with some very convoluted explanations. Some of it which include uh, great conspiracies of science to try to fabricate data. This is not data that's being fabricated. And on the contrary, scientists are looking at a picture of what actually was and taking that and reinterpreting their theories uh, because of the evidence. Whether than the other way around, we interpret the evidence because you have such a strong belief and that you have to ignore what's in front of your eyes. But see, normally, dead plants and animals are eaten or decomposed by a bacteria and by the time it uh, goes by and then not even bones remain from them, you know, sometimes uh, pieces of bones will last a very, very, very long time. But in rare occasions, do you actually have any living tissue that survives past, you know, a few thousand years. Now. The fossils are a different story because what fossils allow us to see is organisms that used to live sometimes even millions of years later and that allows us to have a good picture of life on earth. Now there are many processes that can actually lead to the formation of fossils. One classic process is called mummification and yes that's the same thing that the Egyptians did when they wrapped the uh, bones of their dead in cloth and then they removed the internal organs and did several processes to help desiccate or remove the water out of the tissue. But basically this is something that tends to occur in, in natural environments where it's very, very hot. And a lot of the bacteria that works on decay don't survive very well. And so you have very long time preservations of the living tissue because you delay the decay process. And mummified remains have been found that have been thousands and thousands of years old. There is also freezing, which is a process by which an organism becomes frozen, say, on a glacier, and then thousands of years later we can recover that organism from the ice and pretty much be intact as long as the ice preserved its, its, its contents. And we have found baby mammoths and even whole mammoths that preserve in that manner. So, and there are other animals that also have been found preserved in the ice. That's another process of fossilization. Other remains also can be preserved in hardened tree sap. It becomes almost mineralized, which we call amber. And sometimes insects which were in the tree are trapped uh, on, the, on this amber. And in rare cases, we, occasionally we even found evidence of DNA from these uh, old, old remains. And it will take millions of years for the amber to actually become eroded. So we actually have found such specimens which are millions of years old. Another classic way of making um, these fossils is called tar seeps. Tar seeps are basically areas of the surface where oil kind of just seeps to the surface. And sometimes animals go to that and there's usually water on top and they go inside the water, but then they become trapped inside the tar pit. And then they can come out and then eventually they get covered with the tar and they're preserved in that way. So a lot of fossils are formed in that process. And you also have the petrification process, which is the process by which the living or um, parts of the tissue, replace the minerals, which will normally be the minerals forming uh, mineralization of sedimentary rocks, you know, in other words, you know, sediments will cover the living material, and instead of minerals becoming the things that hold the sediments together, it's going to be the living tissue that holds the rock together, and then what you are left with is, a, is basically a piece of life in the shape of a rock, like you see that tree on the top right there. So. These are some examples of things that can happen to create fossils. When it's all said and done, you have different types of fossils. You have imprints, which are basically, um, you know, sometimes you see a lot of uh, flowers and stems and, and fish and things like that that have been preserved usually in clay and, or other kinds of sedimentary rock. And what it is, is it leaves the original shape of, of the organism imprinted in the rock. It's kind of like it makes a film. On the, rock, on the sedimentary rock and then that displays basically on the surface of the rock the, the features of the organism. On, on, in contrast, you also have cast and molds and that's when the organism is trapped between layers of rock and as they decay, 
you know, they, they basically, their, their, their body just basically goes away, and, but then you're left with a hollow space of what used to be the organism. And then scientists can then use that to cast the shape of what the organism used to be, sometimes even two-dimensionally. So it's really, really cool. So that's, that's different from an imprint. You see, an imprint is when you have just a two-dimensional kind of image of what the organism used to look like left in the surface of the rock. But a cast is going to be a hollow piece of the rock that basically has the shape of what the, the organism that used to be trapped there that was later on decayed. And you find a lot of fossils like that as well. You also find examples of things we call trace uh, fossils. And trace fossils are fossils that uh, leave evidence of the presence of animals or indirect presence of animals uh, in, through, the, through these things. For example, you see footprints or imprints of li living things that used to exist and don't exist anymore. You also see things called cor coprolites, which are basically uh, fossilized feces of organisms. And you also see gastroliths, which are, in, for example, dinosaurs used to have rocks in their stomachs. And so you see these rocks as evidence of sometimes preserving the rocks of the kinds of things that they used to eat. And so these rocks they had in their stomachs to help them digest and grind the food. And now they're usually found near the stomach area of fossils, like you see on the right side there, the image. So these are different types of fossils that we actually look at. But why are fossils so important to study the, the history of life? Because they can tell us about the progression of, of life and how life has changed over time. One special type of fossil is called an index fossil. Index fossils are fossils that only exist up to a certain point or that only exist during a certain era of the history of the Earth like the ones you see in the pictures on the bottom right there. Now what that means is that you can use the presence of that fossil in a rock to help date that rock. For example, if you find a trilobite in a rock, you know it must be from the Paleozoic area because no rocks after the Paleozoic area have trilobites. Trilobites went extinct at the end of the Permian period. That means that if you see trilobites, it must be a rock that's at least 250 million years old. So you see how you can use the index fossils to help date the rocks. Likewise, you know, uh, rocks li uh, fossils like ammonites and belemnites are from the Mesozoic area. They did not survive the Cenozoic extinction, so that means that if you see those fossils, you know they're from the era where the dinosaurs used to dominate the Earth. And scientists use these index fossils to kind of find out what certain layers of rock, what time period certain layers of rock belongs. Sometimes areas of rock are elevated or go down because of movements of the crust, but you can use these fossils to, to help identify you know, what area is older and what area is younger. Remember that because of sedimentation rules, typically what's near the surface is usually younger. Now, while that's true, sometimes the surface of one area is older than the surface of another area, like you see in the top right. So using index fossils, scientists can correlate different areas of the Earth and time different areas of the rock and, and using these index fossils. So index fossils, again, are fossils used to time the rock, to date the rock, because they are fossils that only occur in certain areas of the Earth. Now, the thing about the fossil record is there's, there's some sort of bias in the fossil record, because it, typically it's only going to be the organisms that live in certain areas that have to tend to be preserved. It's very rare for you to find you know, very, very old fossils from areas which are deserts. One, because there's not a lot of living things living there, and second, because you're not going to have a lot of processes such as sedimentation and things like that leading to the formation of fossils. Usually you need, you know, running water and mud slides and things like that to cover the fossils and form the, the fossils which we have today. And you're not going to see that much in, in those areas. Likewise, uh, there's some anatomical features that make the animals more likely to be preserved in fossils. Uh, animals that have hard shells, animals that you know live in certain areas, they will be more likely to be preserved than others. Likewise, animals which are more common, of course, are going to be more likely to be preserved. So sometimes what we see in a fossil record are not just the animals that got lucky to be preserved, but usually the ones which are more common because they're more likely to be the ones fossilized since they're the more common. Likewise, animals which were spread over long areas of the world are, have a greater chance of being fossilized because they're, again, more common space-wise. So that means that when we look at the fossil record, we're not necessarily seeing all the life that used to exist on the Earth. We've seen sometimes animals which have certain features or certain types of niches or they have more, are more common or spread over longer areas. But there is such examples of animals which were rare and by luck they were preserved. 
But you need to understand that there's a bias in the fossil record and that we're not really seeing all of the life that used to exist, but only a minority of the life that used to exist. And even in that, there's been thousands and thousands of different species identified in the fossil records. So imagine how much life there was since we haven't preserved all of it. Another interesting thing about fossils is the idea of missing links and that as we look at the progression of the fossil record and we can see how evolution made changes in, the, in, the, in life, sometimes we have gaps that we don't have that, that leap and a lot of people use those gaps to say, hey, see, there's no explanation for why, how you go from here to there. Now, scientists usually end up finding a lot of these missing links, actually, and they actually do continue their research and end up localizing fossils to build the, uh, bridge, bridge the gaps. And in fact, there's a lot of, of fossils that to bridge the gap, and we call those transition fossils, the ones that show how one organism became a different one, so how a species becomes another species. Now, when you have those missing links, it's usually because of that fossil bias that we just talked about. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a missing link, it just means that they didn't get fossilized. But that doesn't disprove the evolutionary process. All it, all it tells us is that, you know, natural processes are not going to be, you know, perfect in selecting all of the things that they lived to actually become fossilized. So that's the fossil record, and I hope you learned a lot. And, and you don't necessarily need to learn all this detail, but you definitely need to know that fossils are important for the history of evolution, and that fossils in the bottom tend to be older than fossils in the top. And when we see uh, an organism disappear in the fossil record, we know that a, that organism went extinct. And sometimes we see new organisms appearing, knowing, mean, which meaning that they, be, they uh, evolved during that period. And because of that, we can sometimes use organisms to date the rocks and they're called index fossils. All right? Hope you learned a lot. I'll see you in the next video.